Now the Lord God has opened to me by his invisible power, how that every man was enlightened by the divine light of Christ, and I saw it shine through all, and in this I saw the infinite love of God. I saw also that there was an ocean of darkness and death, but an infinite ocean of light and love, which flowed over the ocean of darkness. And in that also, I saw the infinite love of God. These words were spoken over three centuries ago by a wandering preacher who found himself here in one of the most beautiful parts of England. And it was here, surrounded by that beauty, that he founded a religious movement that would reach across the world. I'm Alan Clowes, and tenant of an old inn, the Cross Keys. This is Quaker country, and here in 1652 arrived a man full of a new idea, a new idea of worship, looking for people receptive to his ideas. And here, here he started a new movement. We're going on a little journey now into Quaker country. The name of this man was George Fox. He was only 28 and came from Leicestershire. To understand how he ended up in this remote part of Westmoreland, you have to imagine England in the middle of the 17th century. A country wracked by civil war and a country in religious crisis. For George Fox, that conflict reflected his own personal suffering as he struggled to come to terms with the violence all around him. He rejected an appeal to fight in Cromwell's new model army. Instead, he wandered northwards on a spiritual journey, searching, but not even sure what he was searching for. And what he found was something new to a man from the Leicestershire Plain. George Fox discovered hills and mountains. As we went, I spied a great high hill called Pendle Hill, and I went on the top of it with much ado, it was so steep. But I was moved of the Lord to go atop of it, and when I came atop of it, I was moved to sound the day of the Lord, and the Lord let me see atop of the hill in what places he had a great people to be gathered. What had happened on Pendle Hill was that George Fox had had a vision. Now his journey had a purpose, to find this people gathered, for him to lead. As he set off northwards, he didn't know where he would find them, but he'd already decided in his heart on one great message for his new movement, a message still sadly ahead of its time. I was moved of the Lord to write a paper to the protector by the name of Oliver Cromwell, wherein I did in the presence of the Lord God declare that I did deny the wearing or drawing of a carnal sword or any other outward weapon against him or any man, and that I was sent of God to stand a witness against all violence and against the works of darkness and to turn people from darkness to light and to bring them from the occasion of war and fighting to the peaceable gospel. We don't know the details of George Fox's precise route, but we know from his journal that he found his way from Lancashire into Yorkshire and into a part of the Dales still little known today. This is Dentdale. Fox had had his vision on Pendle Hill and his journey had brought him here, surrounded by the peaks, Ingleborough, Wernside, Penny Ghent. In the distance is the village of Dent. Below us you see little farmhouses, farms that haven't changed in 350 years. Small fields, stone walls, no different now than they were then. Below us a few houses, a few houses gathered together, stone houses it's called. Here were the first ones, the first ones that he met in Dentdale. They'd liked the way he worshipped, they liked the way he spoke. They became convinced. These were early Quakers. And this was the promised land that he was coming into, 1652 country. 
Here in these valleys was a people waiting to be gathered, and Fox was told to search out a man especially. Further down the valley, a man called Richard Robinson. On the way, he met a man and said, could you tell me where Richard Robinson lives? And the man said, where do you come from? And Fox said, I come from the Lord. And the man must have thought, I wonder who I've found here, who this man is. Richard Robinson lived in the hamlet of Brig Flats. It's now a place of pilgrimage for Quakers from all over the world who come to visit the historic meeting house. David Bolton made his own pilgrimage to 1652 country, which inspired him to write his book in Fox's footsteps. David, you were doing the journey from Pendle to Swarthmore. Tell us about his journey down to uh, Dentdale. Of course, what uh, George Fox was doing in 1652 was, uh, I mean, he was a leader in waiting, looking for a following. And he finally turns up at uh, Richard Robinson's farmhouse at uh, Brig Flats. And Robinson, he's very, very suspicious of him. I mean, he's, he, here's this, this um, chap who's obviously come a long way, who's wearing rough clothes, uh, who's got a pretty visionary gleam in his eye. And Robinson's first thought is for his family pewter and his family silver. So he locked him in there, kept him overnight. But in the conversation they had overnight, he was convinced that George Fox really was a rather special um, visionary person. Tell me, David, um, George Fox came to stay with Richard Robinson at Brig Flats and he suggested that he, he meets another group and these were the Westmoreland Seekers. How did they come about? The vitally important thing about Brig Flats is that here George Fox for the first time met the Westmoreland Seekers. The Westmoreland Seekers were a very large substantial group of people who'd broken away from the church, they were fed up with the church, they were very radical in their politics, but they didn't know which way to go, um, didn't quite know how to organise themselves. They had a big general meeting at the very moment that Fox arrives here in Brig Flats. And it's the, it's the meeting of George Fox and the Seekers that suddenly gives the Quaker movement lift off. This is the place where international Quakerism was born, in this tiny little village of one farmhouse and two or three cottages. It had the great vision on Pendle. Do you think that George Fox would know then that those were the seekers that were waiting for him? I think when he climbed Pendle Hill and looked down below and had this visionary moment where he felt that he could see a great crowd of people who would become uh, the Quaker movement. When he had this vision, he'd never heard of the, the Seekers, he'd never heard of any of these radical religious groups that were existing uh, in the Northwest, uh, but something told him that uh, these people down there searching for a leader would meet him searching for a following, and the two would come together and bang, that would be it. Tell me about how the meeting house came to be. For the first few years, uh, Quakers simply met in each other's uh, homes uh, because they had no churches, they had no meeting places. The authorities were absolutely terrified of Quakers. And that seems odd today when we think of Quakers as very nice, quiet, middle-class, decent, um, respectable folk. They weren't really like that at all in the mid-17th century. They were an extremely radical group. They wanted to abolish all clergy, just get rid of them. They wanted to abolish all the church courts. They wanted to completely revolutionise the politics of the country. They wanted women to be equal. I mean, even that. So when they decided to build this meeting house, they said, we're going to say what we want to say about religion and politics. And when I look at this little building now, I don't see some quiet little place that is uh, a shrine to deep meditation. I see a building that is defiant and that represents the best in the English radical tradition. It will be difficult, I think, to determine what came first in Quakerism, the Seekers or George Fox. George Fox has always been um, 
the man who started the Quakers, but I don't think it could have come about if it hadn't been for this group of seekers. In the days that followed, George Fox went to preach outside the church porch in the nearby town of Sedba. If you're so good, shouted somebody, why aren't you preaching in the church? And Fox replied, it's where the people are. That's where the church is. The very next Sunday, in the hills that surround Sedba, Fox showed what he meant. The road that we're travelling now goes across very wild countryside. It comes to a hill which overlooks the Howgills. It's a narrow road. And yet, in Quaker history, it must be one of the most important roads that there is. In those days, it must have been very isolated. We're moving to somewhere where history was really made with the Quaker movement. This is Furbank Fell. Lonely, quiet, and yet 350 years ago, what a difference. And the next first day, I came to Furbank Chapel and sat me down atop of the rock. For the word of the Lord came to me, I must go and set down upon the rock in the mountain, even as Christ had done before. In the afternoon, the people gathered about me. Where it was judged, there were above a thousand people, amongst whom I declared freely and largely God's everlasting truth and word of life about three hours. So here we are. This is what's now called Fox's Pulpit an outcrop of stone on Furbank Fell. There used to be a small chapel in a, in a garth and a graveyard. And gathered here were a thousand people waiting to hear the word of this new preacher, George Fox, Sunday the 13th of June, 1652. And there were many old people thought it a strange thing to see a man to preach on a hill or mountain and not in their church, as they called it. And I was made to open to the people that the steeple house and that ground on which it stood were no more holy than that mountain. So behind us we see the little graveyard where once stood a chapel. Francis Howgill had been preaching in the chapel in the morning and told them that in the afternoon there would be a, a preacher coming to talk to them, a new man, a new message. The chapel's now gone, all there is is one solitary gravestone that's left. But this is Fox's pulpit. Somewhere here stood George Fox. In front of us we see the Loon Valley stretching down towards Lancaster. But here on that day, from all these isolated communities and farmsteads, came a thousand people to hear the word of this new preacher, George Fox. What would he tell them? And they sat and listened in silence. That vision that he'd had on Pendle Hill was here. It was happening around him. He must have felt so jubilant. He must have felt so full of the work of God. What a wonderful man. What a wonderful day. What a wonderful place. Keep your feet upon the top of the mountains and sound deep to that of God in everyone. There is that of God in everyone. That's what Quakers still believe. There's a divine spark that burns in every heart just waiting to be kindled. We feel we don't need a person to tell us how to communicate with God. We are ourselves communicating. Some meetings will be silent. Some meetings will have ministry. This morning we're going to Kirby Stephen, a meeting house that will be like so many meeting houses throughout Britain. We centre down and we get wonderful silence. There's a lady who I once heard of who had been a Quaker all her life and had never given ministry and somebody once asked what had she done to benefit meeting and after a little bit of thought she said 
I assist with the silence. It means a lot, does the silence in meeting. Speech has no meaning unless there are attentive minds and silent hearts. Silence is the welcoming acceptance of the other. Tell me, David, do you think that George Fox would relate to present-day Quakers the way they live, the way they worship? Quakerism today isn't what Quakerism was in the mid-17th century. How could it possibly be? Uh, what George Fox would certainly recognise were, it would, would be the Quaker passion for social justice, uh, the Quaker passion for peacemaking, uh, and Quaker independence from all forms of uh, church and state authority. These are the things that have been enduring uh, in Quakerism, um, but many other aspects of Quakerism would have changed out of recognition, and a good thing too. I'm a, a comparative newcomer to Quakerism, and yet I find it so fulfilling. I find that I think about it all the time. It sounds quite quirky in some ways, and I don't mean it to be, but I love being a Quaker, and it's part of my life. It is my life. Be still and cool in thine own mind and spirit from thine own thoughts, and then thou wilt feel the principle of God to turn thy mind to the Lord God, whereby thou wilt receive his strength and power from whence life comes to allay all tempests against blusterings and storms. <laughs>